Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Calculating the ROI for Data and XML Topic-Based Authoring. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone. This is Sarah O'Keefe. Welcome to the Calculating the ROI for XML and Data Topic-Based Authoring webcast. This session should last about an hour. Uh, we'll have 45 minutes of presentation and then 15 minutes to take questions. The presentation is being recorded, but the questions will not be. Just a couple of things. I see a lot of names that I recognize on the webcast, but for those of you who don't know me, I'm the founder and president of this company here called Scriptorium Publishing. We do what we describe as content strategy for technical communication, so we're interested in applying better tools and technologies and processes and workflows to technical communication. I'm particularly interested in how those things collide and perhaps conflict, the collision of content, publishing, and the new technologies that we do have available to us. For those of you that are on Twitter, you can find me at Sarah O'Keefe, all run together. Scriptorium is at Scriptorium Tech, and if you're planning to tweet this presentation, you might want to use either the TechCom or the DITA hashtags or certainly whatever you want. A couple of quick housekeeping notes and then we'll get into it. Um, most importantly, everybody is muted except for me. I will ask you to submit your questions through the questions area in the webcast interface. I will take those possibly as we're going along in the presentation, but also at the end in the question and answer time that we will leave. We do have a large number of people on this webcast, so we can't open up the audio. It would just make an enormous mess. And we will make the presentation, the recording available generally within a day or two. We promise three days. But we usually are able to do it a little faster than that. So what I want to do today is talk about the business case for DITA and XML and how you go about making that justification. One of the most common questions we get from our customers and potential customers is, well, we think we need DITA, we're interested in going there, but we can't figure out how to justify it. How do we communicate to our management in terms that they understand what the justification is? So that's what this presentation is about. Now, there are some disclaimers that go along with that. I'm going to give you some business case examples with some numbers and some estimates, but your mileage may vary. These are based on real examples. They're based on real companies or maybe a composite of two or three different companies. But your company's cost structure may be different. So you need to take these as examples and make them your own. You can't necessarily just take them and, and wholesale. Uh, I am not a lawyer. So perhaps some of the things that I'm giving you here are not going to stand up to legal scrutiny in the sense that Maybe I've oversimplified the example or I've left some things out. I just want to give you a starting point and an idea of how to go about doing this. And finally, uh, the infamous not WYSIWYG, but WYSIOO, what you see is one option. Just because we do it this way is not necessarily, it doesn't mean necessarily that this is the only way of doing this. I also have some big picture thoughts on issues that go around the business case. Uh, those are not necessarily supported by numbers. So let's take a look at this and talk about how you go about justifying DITA and showing return on investment for DITA in your or in an organization. The first thing you need to know is that if you have localization, if you are translating your content, then you should probably start there with the proverbial low-hanging fruit. It is going to be an easy cost justification for process improvement. When you have a localization um, task in your process, you can estimate that typically 30 to 50 percent of your total localization costs. So if you're working with a localization vendor and they present you with an invoice for a million dollars a year, typically 30 to 50 percent of that total localization cost is desktop publishing. Now again, these numbers are going to vary. I've seen it go as low as 10 percent in an unstructured workflow. And I've seen it go as high as 70 or 80 percent for some, some really bad stuff. But 30 percent is a reasonable ballpark. If you move from uh, desktop publishing-based localization to XML-based publishing, you should be able to squeeze that cost to under 10 percent. That implies that if you have localization, you're going to save something like 20 to 40,000 US dollars per 
$100,000 in localization costs. So you can see that even a relatively small localization effort, you know, three or four hundred thousand dollars is not that much localization. You can easily squeeze a pretty large amount out of that, and suddenly you're looking at a pretty compelling cost savings for your localization effort on the XML side. So I always, we always start with localization. We ask about it first. It's easy to quantify. There's usually a third-party vendor, which means that you know what your localization budget is, and this is a really, really easy place to start. If you don't have localization, then of course you're going to have to move on and take a look at some other things. So the next thing we would look at would probably be content reuse. When you start thinking about content reuse, we have to make some assumptions here. So for starters, we have to assume that you could be reusing more content, and you should be reusing more content. That means we're looking at the question of, is there information in your documents across your entire product line that is very similar or identical, or should be identical, but currently isn't? So that's kind of the starting point. Now, if you do not have any ability to reuse, you don't ever have any information that's reused, then obviously this one's not going to help you at all. But let's assume you have 10,000 topics. And for our purposes, a topic is roughly equivalent to a page. We can, we can finagle this and we can work with it. But let's say 10,000 topics, roughly. And you have a development cost of about $200 per topic. That's $50 an hour times four hours. You might argue that you build your topics faster. You might argue that your development costs are higher. You can certainly work around those numbers. But if you take these numbers as is and then assume that you can get 5% greater content reuse, that's actually $100,000 in savings. So um, because you know 5% more reuse is, uh, what is that? Oh, math. It's um, something like 500 topics, and then you multiply out what it costs to develop 500 topics. Uh, I'm never allowed to do math on the fly. Okay, but I have checked these numbers in the past, and they are, they are accurate. So what you want to do on the content reuse side is you want to look at the question of, are you copying and pasting? And if you are copying and pasting, how expensive is it to copy and paste? How long does it take to copy from one document, find the right document, copy over to the other one, and do that? twice or three times or four or five or six times? What are the error rates? How often do you make a mistake? Or your coworker, of course. Or how often do you forget to make the updates in every location where they're supposed to be made? And I would also look at the, um, the, the, the toll that this takes on your interest in your job. If you're spending all your time costing, copying and pasting, it's just not interesting. It's not fun. It's not entertaining. So something to consider. So um, the other thing you want to take a look at with content reuse is what I would call external content reuse. This is when you're reusing information outside of your documentation. So we're not talking about the core TechCom documentation or the core technical training document. Oh, sorry, training is in here. But things like software error messages, where perhaps the error message itself is in the document, and then also in your software. And if you can create a single point of entry for those software error messages and manage them in one place, you can then reuse both in the documentation and also over in the software itself. Similarly, if you have product data sheets, you might want to share the information, the product specification information that comes from a product database, or should, into the data sheets and also into other places. So this is a case where you might look at an external resource to deliver content that you are putting into your docs or into your information. We, we've seen a number of cases of this in the last couple of years where data sheets were being done by hand in InDesign or FrameMaker or Word but there is, in fact, a database somewhere that has the specs, the length, the width, the height, the, uh, the amperage, the voltage, various other kinds of things that go along with a particular product widget. And it makes a lot of sense to pull that directly from the database instead of hand typing it into your data sheet. 
So there's an opportunity there. Um, you have an opportunity with product descriptions potentially to share with the marketing department. You may be able to write a description, an overview of a product that goes into multiple different places, not just within your TechCom content. Training is a huge opportunity, and of course, whether training is a separate department from TechCom or whether the two go together varies by organization. But in an organization where training is sourcing information out of the tech doc, you may have an opportunity there for training to reuse in a much more formal way instead of, again, some sort of awful copying and pasting. And then last and definitely not least, you have tech support. On the tech support side, uh, the knowledge base type information can be actually kind of a gold mine for content for TechCom, and there's an opportunity there to share information. There's some problems, of course. You know, I tell you that reuse is your friend, but it's, it's never that simple. There are some problems you're going to run into with content reuse, and these are the two big ones. When you implement reuse, or when you try to encourage people to do more reuse, that implies that the content creators, the writers, the trainers, the tech support people, whoever it is that's creating content, they all need to get along and they need to collaborate. That can be a really serious problem, both in cross-departmental teams and also within departments, you can run into scenarios where people don't want to share information or they're just holding it very close to the vest for a variety of reasons, not all of which are really the fault of the writer. You're also going to run into an issue with style. If I write five topics and then somebody else writes five topics and then we need to put those together into a single document or a single deliverable, then we have to write consistently those 10 topics all kind of have to sound the same. And that can be a really significant challenge to implement consistent style standards, much more so than it was in the environment where I write help system A and somebody else writes help system or book B and there's no overlap. So when we have more overlap and more content reuse, we have to be much, much better writers in order to ensure that that consistency is there, that neutral voice is there, and the information can be shared and presented side by side without people being really taken aback by the change in the author's voice. So a consistent, neutral organizational voice becomes quite, quite important. These, though, you'll notice the title I put on these slides, th these are not specifically DITA problems. These are content reuse problems. So they have very little actually to do with the technology. Now, once upon a time, somebody told me that you should not implement XML as a substitute for creating a style guide. This has happened. People look at XML as a panacea, as something that will solve all their problems and make all their issues go away. And if they have process issues, collaboration issues, people that don't like to work together issues, can't agree on a style guide issues, those types of things, you are going to run into problems implementing XML because XML really requires a greater level of maturity and a better functioning team than a non-XML workflow. So somebody else told me also that structure is no substitute for management. And we've certainly seen this as well, that implementing structured authoring does not make the tech doc manager or you know whatever that title may be, the person in charge of the content and the content creator, their job does not go away because they have the ability to enforce structure programmatically. So it's important to keep in mind that there are still, of course, management issues and these tools are not going to make everything all better magically, although we'd like to think so. The return on investment that you're going to get from DITA is going to depend on your team and how high functioning that team is. If you have a not so well functioning, dysfunctional team, a team that doesn't get along, that refuses to collaborate, you're going to have, uh, you're not going to have good return on investment no matter what you do. And this is because you have to have a high functioning team to do all the things that you have to make work in a collaborative, content sharing, topic-based kind of environment. People have to share their topics, and sometimes they don't want to. 
they have to communicate updates. Oh, I'm updating that topic about security, which I think affects your document, so maybe I should just reach out and find out how your product is a little bit different and make the update in a way that will be appropriate for both instead of just making my change and not worrying about your change. Uh, we have run into content ownership issues, and what I mean here is that if you're in an environment where in the past people were responsible for books, if I have been responsible for writing the blah blah administrator's guide for the past five years, and then we make a change where instead of writing the admin guide, I'm responsible for writing all topics related to security, so more of a module-based approach, but those topics are not just in the admin guide, but also in other places. That can lead to a scenario where I don't want to let go of my book. It's mine. And I control that book, and I like that book, and I did a good job on it, and I don't have to worry too much about the other people and how well or how poorly they write. That doesn't work in a topic-based environment. So the content ownership can be, can be a problem. And if there are, in fact, weaker writers in the organization, there can be some significant conflicts there because the stronger writers will look at this and say, well, but, you know, I write to a higher standard than so-and-so over there. So you are going to have some content ownership issues, and that's something to consider. There are, of course, going to be conflicts. There are always conflicts, and a team that likes and respects each other or a team in which the members like and respect each other are going to have an easier time with all of these issues. There are also going to be assignments where perhaps people have to move around, jump from product to product, that type of thing. So you need cooperation. All of this is by way of telling you that although DITA and XML and tools and all of this are, are interesting and valuable and fascinating, you also need a high-functioning team and you can't ignore that side of things. Another factor that you're going to want to look at is the issues around conditional content. And what I mean here is information that, is ver that has variants that are similar. Typically, you will have a topic on, for example, how to log into a piece of software. And you might have half a dozen different pieces of software, but the login topic is probably going to be quite similar across those. And you'll use conditions to flag information that is variant from one product to another. We can do a lot of these in our traditional tools, in our desktop publishing-based tools. But when you reach a certain level of conditionality and a certain complexity of conditionality, you may need to move to XML to support that. Specifically, XML can help you with multiple dimensions of conditionality. So for example, you have platform conditions, information that is uh, Unix-specific, Windows-specific, Mac-specific. You also have information crossing that that is customer-specific. Customer A has an extra feature. Customer B took out a feature. You might have an audience issue, uh, users versus administrators versus supervisors or something like that. So you can use XML to flag a given piece of content with multiple conditions have a huge number of potential variations, and then filter out what you need or what a particular person should be seeing as appropriate. XML will also potentially allow you to do dynamic versioning. So what this means is that instead of rendering three or four or eight variations of your content and then shipping eight help systems or eight books, what you do is you ship the content with all these flags or all these attributes already set that say this is thus and such platform and thus and such customer. And then when the customer requests information, it knows who that person is. They would have to have some sort of login or sign on. And it filters the information on the fly. So you don't have to know what a given customer is going to request. You can just allow the XML and the system to filter it for you at, at runtime or at the time that the person requests the information. There's a quality justification for complex conditional text that you, it'll allow you to eliminate redundancy, have better information in the sense that it'll be more targeted instead of saying, if you have X configuration, do this. If you have Y configuration, do that. And if you have Z configuration, do the other. You filter as appropriate and only deliver the one configuration that that customer actually needs. 
You can meet customer requirements if they're asking for personalized documentation. You can go beyond what is supported in a sort of traditional tool set with versioning, and you may be able to do some dynamic publishing if that's the direction that you want to go in. So most of the justifications I see for XML via conditional text are uh, quality and to a certain extent feature-based. It's we need XML because we can't do what we need to do without it. But you can also make some cost arguments here. So you might say, all right, if I have 40 variations of a deliverable, which is a lot, but it, it does happen, if I configure and publish one at a time, and realistically it's going to take one hour to do each variant, that seems pretty reasonable to me, 40 hours of work per deliverable per release times my original $50 an hour is $2,000 where with dynamic publishing you would just publish. You would just push the button and publish it. And then the filtering happens on the back end. Now, uh, I've made some assumptions here. I can, I can hear the screaming even though you're muted. The, the assumptions I've made are two, two major ones. One is that the tagging work, the actual work of applying the conditions and saying this piece of text is conditional is the same whether you're doing static or dynamic publishing. So I've excluded it from the calculation because you have to do that work no matter what. But the big thing I've excluded here is the programming effort to en enable dynamic publishing. That's going to be somewhere over on the implementation side. And of course, you have to compare that against the hypothetical $2,000 or so that I've shown there. It will be a lot more than $2,000 to enable dynamic publishing. So you're not going to justify this on cost savings, you're going to justify it on features, probably. You really, though, want to be careful with complex conditions. I'll just leave you with a word of caution here. We've seen some cases where people got so down in the weeds with their complex conditions that they really just could not figure out how to do it from an authoring point of view. The system supports it, but it reaches the point where the authors just throw up their hands and say, this is too hard, I can't figure it out, I can't deal with it, and they start copying content so that they don't have to use so many conditions. So other things that you might look at. Yesterday's content is potentially tomorrow's fish wrap. So you probably want to look at the question of time to market. How long does it take you to get your product out the door, get your information out the door, and, and go to market? Now, you're going to see some really sort of large numbers here. If we assume that you have a product with revenue of a million dollars a year, which is you know, a pretty small product, really, if you divide that out across the year, then each week of availability is worth something like $20,000 in revenue. So a million dollars a year is about $20,000 a week. If we can go to Dita slash XML slash whatever and thereby accelerate the delivery of the first language and accelerate the go-to-market time because it takes less time to produce the content, or we can reduce the delays in shipping localized versions, and then you have to look at, okay, for any given localized market, how much revenue am I expecting in that specific market? How much is it worth to ship four weeks earlier in the German market, in the Japanese market, in the Chinese market? Because you can potentially shave quite a lot of time off of the production time in all languages. So the time to market argument, you look at this question of how much are our products worth? And if we ship documentation sooner, does that imply that the products are available sooner? And does that help with revenue? So that's the justification you can use there. Another thing you want to look at is the idea of what, what can you do with this new architecture that perhaps you were not able to do with your traditional existing whatever they may be tools. So whatever tools you have on hand right now, if you're looking at Dita and XML, then there's this question of, well, what does that, what does that free me up to do? And here I'll quote David Kelly, who has the office next door to mine, that you can take, you can use XML and take information away from just being on a page and give it other kinds of roles. Content be can become much more dynamic and much more interesting 
If you decide you want to deliver for mobile devices or you want to create some sort of information app that would go on a smartphone or on a tablet, you can do that. If you want to make your content something that is embedded in the product in some interesting and unusual ways, you can do that. So XML is giving you a foundation that is very flexible and that frees you from the constraints that are imposed by the tool vendors and what they support. If you're inside a sort of, let's say, a help authoring tool of some sort, you're basically constrained by what they will allow you to do or what features they have put in. With XML, you have a platform that will allow you to do whatever you want. Now, the caveat to that is, of course, that there may be some not insignificant programming involved. So if you don't have the resources to do that or a compelling justification to do that, then perhaps you need to stick with what will the tool vendors give me. But there is power here. And especially if you're in a larger organization, by which I mean you have more than, say, a dozen or so content creators, this is something important to look at because you can probably justify it. So some thoughts on things that you might do. User-generated content is one that I've been spending a lot of time on recently. Your source content, your professionally created content, is in XML. You can transform that and post it onto, for example, your website. But it might be presented there side by side with information that the users have created, blogs and forums and wiki content and all the rest of it. And then you can use the metadata that sits on your XML and the metadata that is perhaps in the user-generated information to support some sort of unified search. Now, these three bullets I'm showing you here represent some enormous amount of programming overhead. This is, this is not something that you can just go off and do. Um, so there's a lot of effort here in building this. But it is potentially worthwhile, especially if you have a large, robust user community that is producing content. We've seen some examples where the user community is actually internal. So for example, the tech support organization might be creating a lot of informal content, and there's a need to integrate that with the official, reviewed, approved kinds of content. So something to consider here, whether this is something that you want to take advantage of. If you have people that are of their own free will generating content, can you somehow make that accommodate that within your official stuff. And then there's this very interesting sort of question of at what point does it cease being unofficial and does it become official and what if you take a comment from somebody and put it into your documentation, does that then become no, no longer user generated? So there are perhaps more questions than answers around this slide. Another one I would take a look at is just-in-time publishing or incremental publishing. And what we're talking about here is that instead of publishing a book, you publish topics, a collection of topics. And as you're going along, you might add additional topics that you're adding to that deliverable. So you publish in chunks rather than in deliverables, or in topics rather than in deliverables. This implies you have to have a very, very strong sort of organizational scheme. There are some issues around tables of contents. There are issues around links. There are all sorts of fascinating problems you run into here. But if you are pushing your content to the web, you may be able to move to topic-based publishing. Another very powerful possibility that you have here is incremental deliveries for localization. So instead of waiting until you finish the book and then shipping the book for localization, what you do is you have let's say the book consists of 200 topics, and you finish the first 150, and they're reviewed, they're approved, they're done, but the last 50, you're still waiting on information, they haven't been reviewed, the software is still changing, whatever. They're not sure they're going to include that feature in the final version. So you push the first 150 topics out for localization, and then you push the next 25 as you get those done, and then your final deliverable is the last 25, the last minute one. That can be very, very helpful, again, in squeezing the delay on the back end with localization. You can also look at this question of decoupling content delivery from software delivery. So if you are doing software documentation, or for that matter, if you're doing hardware, consumer products, whatever, typically 
the people creating TechCom information have been bound to the product deliverable deadline. We have a software master, and the content has to go in there, and then we make their golden master, and then it ships. Or the content has to go in the box, and then it ships. Now, clearly, if it's going in the box, you have to have it ready. But if you're delivering online, you may be able to deliver content outside or in addition to the software build and sort of decouple those things so you have your own content delivery system and you don't have to depend on, oh, there's a software patch, so let's, let's get it in there. So there's some, there's some potential there, especially because the content sometimes doesn't, doesn't track nicely with the software. Uh, or it may be easier to ship some incremental or some initial content and then ship the rest of it as it gets done and make updates on the fly. So some interesting possibilities there that you can pursue. We've heard a lot about analytics this year. And at least in theory, you can certainly do this without XML. But XML is very helpful for giving you incremental publishing so that you can make updates. And you need to be able to keep track of your files to do this, which then implies that you probably want XML. So if you're using web analytics, you can measure how topics are used, and you can look at what's popular and what's unpopular, what sort of things are people searching on unsuccessfully, what sort of topics get a lot of comments. Or maybe you have a rating system of you know thumbs up and thumbs down, upvotes, downvotes. Look at what's getting upvotes and what's getting downvotes and see, see where that takes you. What kind of information can you expect? extrapolate from that? What does it tell you about your authoring process and what you should be prioritizing or not? We found in a survey that we did two years ago that data implementation costs, although it varied widely, the average that we got was about $106,000. And you can take a look at that um, article and the link there to the survey to give you a better idea of how we arrived at that number but just about $100,000 on average. These were self-reported numbers. I don't know whether they're accurate or not, but it's the best number I have because there's nothing else out there that, that helps. I'll also mention that we are doing this survey again. It will be open until March 1st, 2011, and I have a link to it at the end of the presentation. I hope you will go and take it because we are trying to get updated information on this. If data implementation cost averages $106,000 US, then your business case needs to show more than $106,000 in cost savings. And you're going to want to do that by looking at, again, localization, increased reuse and the cost savings there, complex conditionality potentially, faster time to market, and support for new publishing architectures. Those are the five factors that I've identified that will allow you to show cost savings and therefore business case. If you can't do it on any one of these, then I would seriously reconsider whether XML is something that you really need. Uh, there's one other one that I've left out of this, and that is regulatory environment. If you're required by regulation to deliver in a certain format, such as XML, then your business case is that if you don't do it, you will go out of business. So that one's, that one's pretty simple. The $106,000 that we came up with there's this interesting question of where does that number come from and what drives it up and what drives it down. So we looked pretty closely at these survey responses, and these are some things that we found that will increase your cost on average. Software integration is a big one. So the issue of we have all this incompatible software and we need them to talk to each other and we really want to make that work. We have a custom build system that nobody else has ever heard of, and we want our automated builds to run through that, and we want you to push the XML through our build system, that type of thing. Complex output and formatting requirements, especially PDF, will drive the cost up. Problems with source files, inconsistent source files. By this I mean the non-XML files that are going to be converted to XML. If those are problematic, then um, the migration can become very, very, very expensive. Also, source files, they're not topic-based. If the source files are very sort of narrative and chapter-based and it's difficult to break them into topics, that increases the cost of migration. Choosing to implement a content management system will increase implementation costs. 
The content management systems are expensive, and they are expensive to implement and configure. So that drives the cost up. That implies that you really want to have a business case that shows a lot more than $106,000 if you're going to justify a content management system. And finally, and perhaps most importantly, people. People increase implementation costs. People who do not want to do this. People who think that XML is a really, really terrible idea. People who don't want to write that way. People who don't want to change tools, those kinds of things. So the success or failure of an XML or really any other implementation project is going to be determined by the cooperation of the users of that system, the content creators. If you're the person leading this, looking at this process of, OK, how are we going to do this? What are we going to do? You have to get people on board. And this is something that is often forgotten in the rush towards the newest, shiniest, happiest tool. Um, I know that I personally think new tools and technologies are a great deal of fun. And it's easy to forget that not everybody, in fact, most people do not think they're fun. They think they're annoying and a necessary evil. Some things that you're going to run into that are important in this area. I've talked about dysfunctional teams, and I've got some additional information about that. But these are the basic problems you're going to run into. Dysfunction, information hoarding, people who say, ah, you will pry X, Y, and Z out of my cold, dead hands. They don't want to look at any other tool. And perhaps most frustratingly of all, taking XML and DITA and then cloning the existing workflow and repeating all the mistakes that are being made in the current workflow. That one, that one really hurts. So if you have a dysfunctional team, what's important to do is to improve communication. You've got to have good communication across the teams. You have to have collaboration. You have to have trust. And my advice would be to communicate with the team and give them a project roadmap for the implementation early on. This is where we're going. This is what we're planning. This is how we're going to do it. This is how long it's going to take. These are the kinds of things we're looking for. Uh, and try and get people to, to see where this is going and why and, and get it up and running. There's nothing in here that is XML specific. This is all about team building. So you know, read every team building thing you can get your hands on and, and pay attention. Information hoarding. This is where people don't share information because it's not to their benefit to do so. So there can be implicit hoarding. So people get cool assignments because only they know how to do that assignment. Or they get less work because it's just too much trouble to get them to do the work. That's sort of an implicit problem. And the explicit one is uh, it's just too much trouble to get them to cooperate. He, you know, I've heard things like, oh, he's short timing. He's retiring in six months. Just don't even bother. But you don't want people to withhold information that the rest of the team needs, because that'll cause problems. So communication bottlenecks. You've got to document your project decisions. You've got to distribute project information. And these bottlenecks can happen even in the most well-intentioned groups and organizations. So I think it's important there to really look at this and make sure that it you know, doesn't happen. The tool-specific view of the world. You know, I only author in something. What you can do here is you can ask people to have an open mind and at least look at the new tool. Not we're going to put in this new tool, but you know, hey, take a look at this. Or take a look at these three or four tools, and you tell me which one you like. Look at new features. I've seen requirements lists where people say, well, it has to do this and this and this and this in this way. And what they're actually saying is, this is how I'm used to doing it in Unstructured FrameMaker. And if it's not exactly the same, then I won't do it. Or I really love how Flare operates. And if this is not identical, then I won't do it. Or I like this feature and author it. And if you don't have it, then I won't do it. Well, what about the new features? What about the features you don't even know about that are new, that are in there. So the tool-specific view of the world is, is a bit problematic. And you really do need to look at you know, what are not just the, advantage, not just the disadvantages and the changes, but the advantages of these new tools. That said, I think it's fair to point out that the XML tools overall are harder to use than the non-XML tools. And you might as well acknowledge that and put it out there and say, you know, they're not as mature, and that's just how it is. That may be an acceptable trade-off. 
Uh, the author may not think so, but the organization might. Cloning. You really, you know, you don't want to clone your existing problems. You don't want to repeat mistakes already made. But what I would do is look at a current workflow and say, well, this stuff really works well, and we're happy with this. And this stuff over here is not working so well, and we want to get rid of that. What are the new requirements that we can't do in the current version? And then this last bullet is perhaps the most important one. It's important to recognize that a change like this, moving to XML, has a really, really significant effect on authors. That implies that it should not be slid in two weeks before a deadline. It should not slide in without training. It should not slide in without support. And it's not fair to expect people to be as productive in the new system as they were in the old system without some time. And that's something I don't see a whole lot of attention paid to. I see a lot of just, oh, we'll put in some new stuff, and then we'll be good to go. And that, that may not be the case. It'll take a few months, maybe up to a year, before people really feel comfortable and feel as productive as they were before in the other tools. So having told you all of this, I decided that it was actually possible to just boil this entire presentation down into uh, one slide with you know about eight words on it. You can look at topics, number of topics or pages that you have, number of writers that you have, number of supported languages, and number of deliverable formats. And if you can match on any of these two, then you can probably justify XML within your organization. So in other words, if you have more than 2,000 topics and at least three languages, you're good to go. If you have uh, you know, smaller number of topics, but more languages and more deliverables, you're probably good to go. So you can kind of look at this and say, if I have any two of these, then you can probably justify it. One thing that didn't make it into the slide is frequent updates, releases, changes. You know, how often do you deliver? What's the velocity at which you're delivering content? And that would be something to consider as well. So, oh, and the question here is, does number of supported languages include English? Um, I think, yeah, I think what we're saying is, well, we're saying English and three others. So it, I suppose it doesn't, unless you argue that that three plus means more than three. But, you know, either way, somewhere around there. Um, this is clearly a rule of thumb kind of thing, so I wouldn't get too, too crazy about it. All right, I wanted to give you the link to our structured authoring survey. So we're looking at adoption rates, issues, tools. My favorite question in there is something like, what was the biggest surprise that you ran into? What is the greatest fear that you have in adopting XML? So I hope that you will consider doing that. We are going to give the results to participants in the same format as we did last time around. In 2009, we embargoed the results for, for about a year. We gave, them, we gave them to all the participants, and then we eventually made them available for free, but not for a while. So I hope you will participate in that, and also, of course, tell your friends and get them to participate. wanted to let you know that we have um, a webcast on data output coming in February that Simon Bate and I are going to do. That is going to be about how to make attractive web help and PDF output and some of the solutions we've come up with there. We have a trends and technical communication coming in March. We don't have a date for that yet. And then we'll do structured authoring survey results in April. So we do have a you know a decent amount of stuff coming down the road and I'm sure you'll you'll see those updates from us. 